personal records or documents. I am surprised when I look back to see that my interest in the materials of the past has shifted quite a bit in my life. That is to say, the first half of my academic life up to the 1980s was mainly based, that is my work was mainly based on uh, national and public records. By that I mean records generated by three sets of institutions which in their business kept materials and these have remained for historians to work on. One of these is state records. By state records one meets particularly the records of the central courts, uh, the assizes, the um, chancery records, the star chamber and so on. These are very huge, absolutely immense, and I spent a lot of time working using those, particularly when I started my first doctorate on witchcraft, I used assize records a lot, and other more localised but state records, quarter sessions records, as well as taxation and other records generated by the workings of the state. A second set were those generated by the church, particularly parish registers, but also a lot um, of work on ecclesiastical court records, uh, particularly the archdeaconry records in the area I worked in Essex, and tithe records and other church records. And the third set were generated by the Lords of the Manor. The Manor Manorial Organisation was run by two courts, the Court Baron, which dealt with land holdings, and the Court Leet, which dealt with minor uh, misdemeanours like um, fishing when you shouldn't fish and um, poaching and um, on a minor scale and so on and so on. And these are huge. The uh, manorial records are the biggest of all, just for one manor. In fact, we uh, worked on two manors. They are hundreds and hundreds of feet of manuscript and uh, no one had ever transcribed all the records for one particular manor before our project on Ellscombe. So those were the main records I thought I would use and much of my work and the description in the two books um, Reconstructing Historical Communities and um, Records of England these two books An Introduction to the Records were mainly describing those two sorts of material but in my later life, I've become much, much more interested in much more personal records created by an individual in one way or another, rather than an institution. This is what I've been working on in the last 20, 30 years, but in fact it had started earlier because when I was working on witchcraft, I came across the diary of a 17th century clergyman Ralph Jocelyn, and I wrote a book about him based on his diary. And that, of course, is a very personal document. And later, Sarah, my mother and I edited the diary of Ralph Jocelyn for the British Academy. And while doing that, I became aware of the wealth of diaries and, to a certain extent, autobiographies. The English were great diary keepers, and so I collected uh, in my library as many diaries, Kilvert's diary, Pepys's diary, and so on, and thought these were a wonderful source, which they are. And um, later I came to realise that diaries were not just those kept by others, but um, kept by Sarah and I. We started to keep diaries in 1978, and these become increasingly interesting as time passes because one forgets so much and there's so much incidental description of how we were working, where we were going, our friendships and so on. 
and so one day we may make some use of that, though we make use of it all the time in all sorts of different ways. But particularly, um, the diaries were important for travel, because um, for anthropological fieldwork, the diary is one of the central recording devices. And so in my book on uh, becoming an anthropologist, my fieldwork in Nepal, the first fieldwork, a lot of it is based on the diaries which Jill, my wife and I, kept in Nepal. And later in the travels to Japan, in the book Discovering Jap the Japanese, and particularly in our 17 trips to China, Sarah has kept really good diaries. And when um, these are supplemented by the notes, very detailed notes that she took on all sorts of matters of fact and conversations and so on. These um, travel diaries and home diaries are a wonderful source. But they, all of them, lack one feature. That is that they tend to be written for yourself and therefore you take a great deal for granted and don't really need to describe or suggest or give context for all sorts of things. That is done in an even more remarkable source, and that is letters. I was taught that I should write a letter every week to my parents in India um, from the age of eight, and throughout my life I've been writing and writing and writing letters and getting letters. And particularly uh, the letters of my mother from Assam, which I've published in a book, 20 Years in Tea, as well as the ones that she wrote and are included in all the volumes of my autobiography, are remarkable. She used letters as a sort of diary and um, as raw materials for later writings. And so her letters taught me a great deal and contain a great deal. My letters to her started pretty uh, feebly, but got better from about 17 or 18. And from about 19, I started to keep carbon copies of my letters. So I have letters going and coming back, particularly intense letters to my first two girlfriends and later to Sarah, um, and other letters to interesting academics, um, all sorts of correspondences about ideas, because letters, I realized, were a place where you tried out ideas as well as describing places and things. Uh, diaries were where you noted what had happened, really, whereas letters were a, a place to have a conversation. It was a form of conversation. And in each case, you had to explain to the other one what you were seeing. And then when we came to work on the archives given to me by my grandmother about my ancestors, it was the letter collections, the letter collections from India, the letters within Britain, letters, a uh, letter book from a Jamaican judge, and um, many other sets of letters which were really, really interesting. And Sarah has edited these into a number of volumes which are increasing, including recently the uh, autobiography of my grandmother, but that's uh, not an autobiography, a, a diary. So letters, then there of course there are many other things. There are visual records, there are photographs, there are paintings, there are thousands of um, sections of film which I've taken over our lives. Um, there are account books and we have an excellent set of account books which Sarah's kept for 40, 50 years and uh, my ancestors' account books, and there are scrapbooks, uh, some lovely Victorian scrapbooks of my relatives. So you have a miscellaneous collection of personal records, and each time you pick up any of these, particularly letters, you can enter into the mind of someone who probably is dead and thought in some different ways or similar ways. So personal records are a joy, and I've really enjoyed uh, working later in my life on that type of material. 
and I hope you keep a diary too.